Dave here, how are you? I have just finished building this magnificent swing set. Why build a swing set in the garden? Easy answer, we have grandchildren and they enjoy, enjoy playing on swings. Why did I decide to build one instead of buy one off the shelf at a hardware store? The ones at the hardware stores didn't really have the kind of character that I was after. I showed Vicky a couple of designs that I'd come up with and we settled on one and we said, right, let's do it. Where to put the swing? The problem that we have was because the block of land is a good sized block, we didn't want to concentrate all of the things that are on the property in one small area. We thought it'd be nicer to kind of move things out from decentralized things and have points of interest around the garden. Now we've chosen the position, it's up to creating and buying the material. First part is working out what sections of material I needed. It has to look good, plus it also has to be structurally sound. It had to be very strong. People will be, you know, 80 odd kilos swinging backwards and forwards on this frame. And that's a massive amount of force for this frame to resist and not just pull out of the ground. I came up with the design of two large posts at either end. We'll call these our end frames. And the frames had to be joined together prior to being concreted in. All of these things created some problems to be solved. I visited the local Mitre 10 store up at Katoomba and I had a look at all of their racking out in the wood yard. I nearly bought 90 by 90 posts and I noticed they had some 112 by 112 laminated H4 treated pine and they were three meters long. And I thought this is ideal. It's going to suit. I didn't want it too skinny and look like it's standing up on toothpicks. I needed it to look as though it was meant to be. I ordered it all and it arrived up out of the street because trucks can't come into this property. Had to load it all onto the trailer and then bring it into the property and then unload it into the timber rack because I wasn't quite ready to build it yet. I had other projects on. First thing to do was to dig some holes in the ground. So I started with one hole and I made sure that the holes were only the post hole shovel diameter as I went down with the post hole shovel. And that's for a couple of reasons. I wanted to find the depth of the ground because in the mountains we don't have very deep soil and I was going to hit rock and I wanted to make sure that I got all the way down hit rock before I move on to the next hole. So I did that, dropped the post in and the good thing about the narrow hole as well is it stopped the post rocking all over the place. It nearly stood up perfectly on its own. I got one of the rafter sections that I'd purchased and I used that as a beam to assist in getting a level point. Even though there is a slope downhill, the swing set is positioned perfectly level across the hill. Very important when you're swinging with other people, you don't want it to be down here like this and you think, hello, look at you over there. Look, you got five feet below you before you can touch the ground. So level. How I did that was I clamped one of these rafters to the post got the post upright, put my six foot level on top of the rafter, which is now actually just being used as a beam to help in the layout. And I moved the rafter up and down the hill a little bit, pivoting on this post until the level was reading level. Got that position, measured it along the ground. I think it was four and a half meters overall and marked the ground where the next post hole was going to go. Dug that hole. Brought the rafter back up to the post again, clamped it on there, level, used my roofing square at that point against the edge of the post and against the rafter, back towards me downhill and measured 900 millimeters because that's the width of these end frames that I'm making. 900 millimeters, marked the ground, dug another hole with the post hole shovel, popped another post in, did all this at the other end as well, then I have four posts in the ground. There I go around and I mark a level datum on all of the posts. So I was going to build this swing set from those level lines up. Now I needed to remember where, which post was where and what direction they were. So I went around and I marked each post individually. A for one, B for the next one, C for one, D for the next one. And then I had all four posts identified. I got a piece of paper and I wrote on the paper the direction of the fall 
and marked each post where they were going to go. Done. Pull all the posts out, bring them into the workshop and then take them over to the CNC because I needed to trench out the top for a joint for lintels to drop into the top of these posts. So they're on the CNC and I've done a quick design in Aspire, brought that file, the code, over to the CNC, loaded it into the machine. It did the checkouts in the top of the post for me. I rolled all the posts over, keeping them in line again. The machine did it all again. The advantage of this machine, because it's about three meters long, it, all the posts could fit on here. That was a big plus. I cut the tops off the posts at the capex. And I thought, I, to make it a little bit more interesting and a bit more ornate to, to blend in with the property, I'll do some fluting. Anchored all of the posts in position and I did three sides of all four posts. The one side that wasn't done was the side that was going to be facing in towards the frame because I wanted to have angel wing bracing inside these end panels. So I didn't want the fluting there to, to make it look too busy. So it's just on the outside. Brought the posts over here and they were paired A and B, C and D. Popped them on the table, got the domino, put in 12 millimeter, 50 millimeter deep domino holes. So basically that's the mortises in the cross rails and also in the posts at the right position. Actually, I did it in the rails first and then I transferred those rail positions onto the posts. And it's very easy. There's, this, there's a couple of little identifying marks on the domino that will help you align things if you're going to get a domino check that out. And so it did it beautifully. I got some Bessie uh, parallel clamps and I had some 300 millimeter ones at, on the ends of the posts. So when I roll the posts over, ready to pull the frame together, they would support the ends because they were the same height as the clamps that we're going to be doing all the work here. I uh, started clamping it up and, you know, a bit, bit at a time and I realized I was, the frame was skewing a little bit. So the way around that is to move the clamp instead of being straight across, you can move the head maybe an inch to the left or an inch to the right, depending on which way you want to pull it. As you tighten it up again, it will want to try and pull it straight. So it will rack the frame either away from being square or making it square. A little bit of trial and error and it got it perfect. I used the roofing square inside, got them spot on. Let that dry. Now, whilst that's happening, I'm also having to design the lintels. Now the lintels that go across the top are going to support the rafters above that. These lintels are going to go into the checkouts that are in the posts. I was mucking around with it and my granddaughter Emerald was visiting at the time and she became very interested in what I was doing. And together we designed these little kind of profile ends. And I designed a couple and with Emerald's help we came up, she decided on the ones that we ended up going with. And then also I did some text because I thought, why not make a feature out of it? And we did some text across the lintels as well to make it. When you go to a park, there's always, you know, foundation stone was laid by or the, the name of such and such memorial park that's in, in part one of the, the bits of furniture or the swings. Then I docked the lintels to length, took them to the CNC one at a time, cut out the profile ends and then ran the text with the inch and a quarter V cutter I think I used. Put the lintels over the router table and using a quarter inch round over cutter and a bearing, tidied up all of the areas facing down. Did not do across the top because I knew further down the track rafters are going on top. The other things I had to do with those, with those lintels was drill holes ready for the type 17 100 millimeter, five millimeter drive screws, internal recess drive screws. I drilled holes through. Now because the 100 millimeter screws were going to, if I drill them in exactly the same position for the lintels either side, they would have met in the middle and created a headache for me. So I offset the screw holes by 10 millimeters on one side, one lintel, in comparison to the other and they went in as pairs. Put all the lintels to the side. One of the other things we were doing was I needed to create all the rafters 
and also the angel wing braces. So start off with, let's talk about the angel wing braces. Again, I designed them all in Aspire, took them to the CNC. This is the piece of timber that I cut the angel wings out of. It's great. That's 185 by 42 millimeters, and it was all cut out with a quarter inch cutter. I joined the angel wings together at the top, so there'd be a profile going out both ways, and I joined them with a domino. Now the headache that I had was I got the measurements wrong. I made a mistake. They were around 15 millimeters too narrow. They did not fill the hole. Because I had angel wings at the top and also at the bottom in each end panel, that was the design, I would join those together and make a full unit. To do that, I used another piece of the H3 pine and took it over to the bandsaw and cut out a notch on either end so I had a nice joint. The inside of the angel wing where it finished was going to finish in line with the edge of the 42 millimeter stuff that I just cut and then glued it all together. Now, <laughs> that took me a while, but I got there. I glued the pair of the panels together, and as they say, you can never have too many clamps. It's true. Uh, let it all dry, took it out of the clamps, went over it with the Rotex to clean up all the joins, put it over the bobbin sander, cleaned up all the inside and the external parts on the bobbin sander, and the machine is fantastic. Over the router table again, the quarter inch cutter. Uh, at this stage also, we painted it with the undercoat primer sealer. I think we actually put two coats of white gloss at that stage as well. We needed to concrete the posts in position. Now because the holes were the right depth, I, I couldn't go any deeper because I'd hit rock. I opened those holes up to 300 millimeters diameter now because the skinny holes were fine for holding the posts up, but nowhere near enough concrete to mass around the base of the posts and hold them in position. I opened them up to 300 millimeters each hole. That's a bit of work, but it finally got there. Then I put a piece of timber at the back of each hole, carried the frames up and set them on the ground dragged them up to position against the these kind of like a slipway or a slide and then stood them. The reason these two pieces of wood are in the ground to stop the back of the holes caving in as the posts were sliding down, the bottom of the post was sliding down, I just chopped the side out of the hole. And I didn't want waste, I didn't want any spoil in the bottom of the hole. Popped them in, stood them up and I used some of the rafters again before I'd actually cut them and clamped them onto the post to hold it in position because it's not going to go anywhere with these clamps. They're horribly strong. Did this on both ends, clamped in position, and then I can start to concrete. I made the concrete a little wetter than I would normally do. The reason being the ground was quite dry. It was quite hot, it was around 38 degrees Celsius while I was doing this. And the ground absorbs the water out of the concrete very quickly. And I wanted to agitate the concrete around the posts to compact it, pack it in tight against the top post. If the mix was too stiff, it would not pack in adequately. So I used one of the pieces, one of these skids that I slid the post down with as a compacting stick, made sure that the concrete was all the way around. I finished the concrete level about two inches below the ground level because I like to backfill with a bit of dirt and the grass can grow right, go right up to the edge of the post. It looks as though no concrete was ever there. Those in, let them dry before I put any load on it. A couple of days later, I came over with the lintels that are already drilled out ready, marked the right width thin, and screwed those into position. And this is when it starts to get really exciting when you see all this start to evolve. After the concrete dried, I could bring the rafters into the workshop and work on them here. Now the rafter tails, I wanted something that was going to be, I wanted to lighten their appearance up and hence this is why people create fancy little ends on timbers that are on pergolas. Again in Aspire, I got the uh, circle vector creator tool out, it's just so easy. Created some of these circular vectors and some straight lines and next thing you know I've got it ready to put on the uh, machine, but instead of putting the rafters on the CNC, I created a template, a piece of quarter inch plywood, and that will cut it out very quickly. Perfect. Took it over to the rafters, marked it. 
on all the rafter ends and then got the jigsaw out and cut all the way around and I had to do this very neatly because two of those rafters were going to get screwed together and the pattern had to follow as good as possible without me spending too much time sanding it neat. Talking about that once I've got it all done I then get the, the uh, two rafters and screw them together and then all of the rafters I use the belt sander on, use the nose, the front wheel, and I use the Triton belt sander, it's fantastic. The front wheel in against the internal radiuses, and then the flat section with belt sander on the flats and the external radiuses. Then it was a matter of cutting a checkout in the underside of the rafters where they were going to be sitting over the lintels. I didn't want it just to have, you know, butt joint. I needed it to sit over, so it reduced any rocking. And I needed to clean those cuts up a little bit. I wasn't too good with those. I used the little mini palm uh, belt sander from Triton in those because I could fit it in there where the bigger machine couldn't. And also a chisel and a mallet just to tidy the corners up. Came up very, very nicely. Now, one of the other things that I was doing as I was going along, I realized that I wanted to put solid blocking in between the rafters when the rafters finally went up. And to do that, I, need, I cut the blocking to length. And then I thought there's going to be a lot of demand on this swing, on this main beam, as people are swinging. You're looking at 70 or 80, maybe 90 kilos of weight pulling from one side to the other. That's a lot of force it's going to try and, you know, pull nails and screws apart. So I thought the best thing to do is put threaded rod right the way through the whole lot. But I didn't want to see the threaded rod. So my way around that was I ripped all of these blocks down the center on the table saw, broke them into two halves. Then I set the saw up at 45 degrees and lowered it and then had a little bit of a muck around with the, uh, with the pushing the block up towards the blade without it turned on obviously, so that I would get a 40, two 45 degree cuts and have that off cut still stay in there but I could get rid of that after. And I did that and it went beautifully. So then I pushed all of the timber through the saw and notice I still have the riving knife on there so it was all very safe. Then pulled out that waist section. I had to make sure the waist section stayed in there otherwise it would have been a missile that would, would fly back at me while I was cutting and I didn't want that. Applied glue to all of the pieces. I marked them all so that I knew which one was which. So it was exactly the same piece of timber, but it was just glued back together. I did all this uh, in the clamps, tightened it all up, made sure that the ends were, were, were good, got the scraper and cleaned off the excess glue. When it dried, took it out of the clamp, put it through the drum sander. I angled the timber in the drum sander so it was maximizing all the width of the belt. Did that a few times and run it through straight. Bring it back over here, run a bit of a round over on it. I decided to use pocket holes in the solid blocking to hold everything in position. It's a pretty good idea really when you think about it. The half joints are going to hold the rafters pretty well. But the pocket holes, I put two pocket holes into each block so they go into either rafter either side. And then also two pocket holes facing down and they would screw into the lintels. Now that worked, worked very well. And then took it everything out. Popped the rafters up. I measured to the center of the rafters. The reason being that's where I wanted the center lot of blocking to go. The other two blocks were going to go at the ends over the lintels so they would be in position automatically. The center part was very important. Drill the hole through the rafter at the right height so that when the booker rod or the threaded rod went right the way through, I wasn't going to have it colliding with anything. And it went in beautifully. I'm putting the rafters up, I needed to be aware that I needed to get a drill in as well to put the pocket hole screws in. I clamped the center rafters and the outside rafter with a block in between, clamped it up tight, put the pocket hole screws in, took the clamps off, did that at either end counterboard through the center with a 5 8 or 16 millimeter speed bore. Drove the booker rod through. Um, actually, I backed the nut off a little bit on the booker rod so that as I was hitting the end, I wasn't stuffing the thread up. But I don't think it would have mattered that much. But anyway, that's, that's how I did it. Went round to the other side with the socket and tightened the booker rod up and it's as tight as a drum. It is not going anywhere. It will resist the force of the swing 
adequately. I fitted the angel wing frames into the end frames and they came up fantastic. But before I did that, the offcuts from the lintels, you know, these little decorative corners, I cleaned those up, put a round over on them on the router table, hit them up with some paint, drilled a hole on a countersink and glued and screwed those into each corner of these end frames. And it was just one of those things as I was going along, I thought they looked fantastic. Then I can put the uh, angel wing frames in. I had to actually fit them because one of them was a little bit long. So I did that here on the docking station. It was easy, took it up, glued and screwed those panels in and a little bit of filler here and there where I didn't quite get it right. Whilst all this was happening, I cut all of the sun slats. These are the, I think there was around 40 or 50 of them that go on top of the rafters. Now, these, I cut them all on the capex. And when I cut them, Vicky was painting them with the, painting the end grain with a primer sealer undercoat. And they were all stacked there. And I also cut all of the little spacing blocks and they're about 60 millimeters long. That's too small to have my finger near the blade of the capex. So I used what's called a 10 million dollar stick. I set the stop up on the saw to 60 millimeters, presented the 42 by 42 millimeters from the right hand side, held it in position with the 10 million dollar stick, cut it and repeated the process about a hundred times. All of those blocks needed to be painted as well and again Vicky did an amazing job painting all the end grain and the sides and had them all stacked all around the place. And we had this mountain of sun slats and blocks. After that, I needed to drill them all. So all of the blocks were easy to drill just by hand. Put a, a, a five millimeter brad point drill straight through, finished. But the sun slats, I needed to make sure that all the holes were in the same position. It just looks a whole lot neater if you ever manage to see on top of someone's roof or anywhere you see a whole line of screws, it's nice to see them all line up. And so that's what I did. I made a template for drilling the holes for the sun slats and it was 300 millimeters plus another 20. So it was 320 millimeters from the end of the sun slat to this hole. And it was easy, the, the, the template and the thickness of the sun slat were more than the depth of the drill. So I could just sit it here, drill straight down, move it onto the next slat, hook the jig over the end of the slat, drill, hook the jig over the end of the slat, drill, do the same on the other end. And it was done before I knew what happened. I needed to make sure that all of the sun slats were, had exactly the same overhang. So I set up a string line. Now, before I set the string line up, I made two more jigs. Now the jigs have got a very small, nail without a head at around 350 millimeters in from the end of the piece of timber. And from that nail back out again, I measured 300 millimeters and put a larger nail at 180 degrees on the opposing face or edge. Seeing it square, it's hard to say face or edge, isn't it? But on the opposing side, put the nail in and that was to put the string line around took these two pieces up to the swing set, put them on the rafters, uh, out past the line of where the sun slats were going to go, clamped them in position using that small nail as a reference point. So I just slid that profile up till I hit the small nail, clamped it in position, put another clamp to stop it twisting, did the same at the other end, put the string line on and I'll talk you through how to tighten I'll up the string line. I'll show you this part with the headset. I haven't really got anywhere up here that I can get in with uh, the other camera. So what I've done is I've put, this is basically a nail that's 300 millimeters out from there. I have put a very fine uh, nail without a head on it there that's 300 millimeters back from this point. Um, I wanted a more substantial nail because I'm going to pull this string line up against it. I, on the string line here so it doesn't fall on the ground. I've just turned it around and hooked it over there like that and it stops it dropping. Here I want to pull this line tight so I'm going to twirl with my finger, hook it over the nail and then slide back here a little bit as I say it's a little awkward and I'm going to pull towards me 
and towards the nail. So I'm pushing towards the nail with my left hand and pulling with the right hand. When I've got it to there, where I think it's reasonably tight, a little bit more, I'll pull it back behind itself and let go. And that's it. Now I have a nice taut string line down to the other end and I'll reference all of these little sun slats now I need to, to get point. work from below and put the middle slat in. I didn't want to put start from one end or the other. I wanted to start from the center because any error would be halved as I'm going out both directions. Of course, there's a lot of slats and they can tend to creep around a little bit as you're moving along. The other reason is because I wanted to work from below to get that first one on or first few as a matter of fact so that if I was working off a ladder from the side, I wasn't deflecting any of the rafters. And when I take the ladder off, the whole thing spring back after I put the first couple of slats on. Worked from below, screwed the slats in position, then climbed up on top, moved the ladder out of the way a little bit. And then I had all the blocks up there in buckets and away I went. And that took a while. I used the Bessie parallel clamps the reason being you can turn them upside down and tighten rather than have your hand down, which took me a little while to remember, but I finally remembered. Turn it up the right way and clamp up. And as I'm going along as well, screwing these down and working to the string line, I was measuring it off to the end, off to the solid blocking to make sure that when I got out to the end, it was going to be parallel to the solid blocking. Nothing worse than it being skewed off a little bit. You would see that from below and it, and it to me, that would bug me. Finished putting all the slats on and the blocks and it looks fantastic. I needed to put some timber plugs in where I'd done the pocket holes. Pop those in. I made a little uh, timber pusher for the plugs and push those in. That worked great with glue. Let them dry. Sanded it off with a little RTSC, the little Festool RTSC sander, which is a cracker. Um, sanded it off with the sander and then Vicky came around and painted. Now, well, I was looking at the whole project from down on the drive and I thought it looked two-dimensional. So from the end, you've got these nice angel panels and they overhang with the, the, uh, the, the rafter tails look really, really nice. But from down below, looking back up, there was, there was no real ornateness to it. So I, and also I noticed that from the other end, if I gave the frame a little bit of a push, it was rock solid, you know, up and down the valley, but across there was a little bit of whip in it because there was no bracing units. So I decided to make some larger angel wings, which I did, and I'll show you the frames for those. So these are for the big fellows. These, this is what I cut. There was four angel wings that I cut out of this. And you can see they are big, bigger. If I hold them up, you can see them comparatively as to what I did. So I, so I designed those in a spire, threw them on the CNC, cut them out. This time I used a 3-8 cutter. I'm, I'm starting to learn with it. And uh, spiral up, uh, drilled some holes for the screws, the Type 17 screws, took them up and put them in position, clamped them in position, put the screws in. What a difference. All of a sudden, this thing had form. Got some eye bolts, put them up into the, the frame, working, you know, so it was all central. Put the, uh, the baby seat, baby swing, right in the middle. Put the adult swing halfway between, put this other one, this other contraption swing to the right. Took them all down when we were happy with everything, and then Vicky painted the whole thing. She painted the flutes beige, it's actually called a color called warm neutral, and all the rest was high gloss white. And she picked out all of the lettering, Stanton Park, as well with the, uh, with the warm neutral. And it looks fantastic. Now further down the track, I am going to make a big garden bench swing chair to go into this frame. But that's another video for another day. Thanks again for watching. If you like what I'm doing, share the video around, show other people. They might be interested in what I'm up to as well. Give me a thumbs up if you reckon it's worth it and keep on coming back and I shall see you next time. Bye.
You don't want to go too high? Do you want me to catch you? Do you want me to catch you or you want to keep going? That'll do it. That's it.